Um, I've got an article, uh, you know, kind of as a segue into our Bible study today. I think for Ellen, I think it was from you, from Brad Pitt. Okay. Yeah, l- l- listen to this. Let me take my glasses off to read it to you. It's a good thing Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie are now working on separate projects 10,000 miles apart because the screen hunk has sworn off soap. And before they parted ways, Brad's bride-to-be, I thought they were married, but they're not. They're like everyone else in Hollywood, uh, complained that he stinks. Brad, who's currently in England filming the World War II epic Fury, recently started using a homemade concoction of lemons, uh, water, apple cider vinegar instead of soap, uh, a source says. And Brad says he's read up on the toxins of soap, especially the antibacterial ones, and feels that using them and antiperspirants is not only bad for the planet, but it also speeds up the aging process in humans. So Brad's worried about losing his looks like he's going to be a regular guy one day, right, fellas? Yeah. Hey, all the ladies went, oh, Brad. But Angie was revolted and their kids even started calling him Stinky Daddy. (laughs) Angie agreed to humor him only as long as they weren't on the same continent. So so he's doing all this stuff to try and stay young and keep that that look that he has. And what does that have to do with today's teaching? Absolutely nothing. (laughs) Now our our teaching today, we're in the second week of our series, What's It Like to Be Brad Pitt? I mean, what's it like to be the, one of the wealthiest men in the world, the most desirable men in the world? Uh, he can have anything and anyone, anytime he wants. What, what, what a dilemma poor Brad is in, right? But as we looked at last week, um, he, he really doesn't qualify to answer that kind of a question, does he? Because he has limitations, even with his fame and fortune and all of this. But there was a man that lived long ago that could answer those questions for us. His name was Solomon. In the book that we're looking at in Ecclesiastes, he calls himself Koheleth. Koheleth, it's Hebrew for the assembler, the one who has assembled people because I've got something really important to say, okay? And this is a guy that could have anyone he wanted, anytime he wanted, and anything he wanted. And somewhere in the middle of his life, he decided to perform all of these life experiments to figure out where there's meaning in life. To see if he could find happiness and meaning in having a lot of relationships. So he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. He wanted to find out if he could find meaning in life by uh, getting a good education. He learned more than anyone who'd ever come before him. Wisest man that ever lived on the earth. And so he's performing all of these experiments to try and find the meaning of life. Okay? And today he continues with his fifth experiment. Won't you open your Bibles with me to uh, uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Ecclesiastes chapter 2. And that's where we take up our Bible study. I, I said in my heart, come now. I will test you with mirth. You ought to circle that word in your Bible. Therefore, enjoy pleasure, but surely this also was vanity. I said of laughter, madness, and of mirth, what does it accomplish? I searched in my heart how to gratify my flesh with wine, while guarding, uh, guiding my heart with wisdom, and how to lay hold on folly till I might see what was good for the sons of men to do under heaven all the days of their life. I made my works great. I built myself houses and planted myself vineyards. I made myself gardens and orchards and I planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. And I made myself, notice that's a key word, myself, myself, myself. I made myself water pools from which to water the growing trees of the grove. I acquired male and female servants, and I had servants born in my house. Yes, I had greater possessions of herds and flocks than all who were in Jerusalem before me. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the special treasures of kings 
and of the provinces. I acquired male and female singers, the delights of the sons of men, and musical instruments of all kinds. So I became great and excelled more than all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me. And whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. Now think about who else in history could say that. Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor. And this was my reward from all my labor. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had done, and on the labor in which I had toiled, and indeed all was vanity and grasping for the wind. There was no prophet under the sun. Well, then I turned myself to consider wisdom and madness and folly. For what can the man do who succeeds the king? Only what he has already done. And then I saw that wisdom excels folly as light excels darkness. The wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. Yet I myself perceived that the same event happens to them all. So I said in my heart, as it happens to the fool, it also happens to me. And why was I then more wise? Well, then I said in my heart, this also is vanity. For there's no more re remembrance of the wise than of the fool forever. Since all that now is will be forgotten in the days to come. And how does a wise man die? As a fool. Therefore, in light of all of this, he says, I hated life. Because the work that was done under the sun was distressing to me. For all is vanity and grasping for the wind. Well, then I hated all my labor in which I toiled under the sun. Because I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he'll be wise or a fool. Yet he will rule over all my labor in which I Toiled and in which I have shown myself wise under the sun. This also is vanity. Therefore I turned my heart and despaired of all the labor in which I toiled under the sun. For there is a man whose labor is with wisdom, knowledge, and skill. Yet he must leave his heritage to a man who has not labored for it. This also is vanity and a great evil. For what has man from all his labor and for the striving of his heart with which he has toiled under the sun? For all his days are sorrowful and his work burdensome. Even in the night his heart takes no rest. And this also is vanity. Nothing is better for a man than that he should eat and drink and that his soul should enjoy good in his labor. This also I saw was from the hand of God. For who can eat or who can have enjoyment more than I? For God gives wisdom and knowledge and joy to a man who is good in his sight. But to the sinner, he gives the work of gathering and collecting that he may give to him who is good before God. But this also is vanity and grasping for the wind. Notice the recurring phrase, once again in our Bible study, vanity, uh, grasping for the wind. We talked about the word vanity last week. It's the word habel, right? Would you say that with me? Amen. Very good Hebrew, folks. Habel. It's all emptiness. I tried to find meaning in this. It was empty. I tried to find meaning in that. It was empty. Everywhere I tried to find fulfillment and purpose and, and joy, it was habel was just empty and of the phrase grasping for the wind we looked at that in the Hebrew it's like feeding on the wind and I gave you the metaphor of a uh, pouring yourself a bowl of uh, air cereal right and you put the spoon in the bowl and you take a big bite of air cereal and well it doesn't really satisfy me right so let me take another spoonful and how many bowls of air cereal would you have to eat to feel full you could never get full could you right it's just air 
And that's what he means when he says grasping for the wind and Havel. It's just futile. Everything that I tried to find meaning in, it was futile. Now let's get into the first uh, experiment of today's Bible study. I think it's the fifth experiment that he performs. In verse 1, he says, I will test you with mirth, he says of himself in his heart, right? And the word mirth there in Hebrew is the word taub, uh, T-O-W-B, but it's the, you know, Hebrew always has that all kind of a sound, taub to it, right? Taub, and you say, well, what does mirth or taub mean? Well, it means righteous deeds. It means kind deeds. It means good deeds. It means thing, doing things that would make you feel good about yourself, I guess is the simplest way to describe this word mirth or taub. Um, today, we would call it benevolent work, right? Benevolent work. And the question that he's asking in verse 1, is there any lasting enjoyment and pleasure in benevolent work? You know, what's significant about that for you and I is this. Have you noticed how the wealthy and the famous seek meaning in benevolent work? After they reach a certain level of wealth and fame and fortune and all of this, all of a sudden you've got Sean Penn down in Haiti. You've got Brad and Angelina. Angelina's adopting children from impoverished countries. You've got Bill Gates doing things, Oprah Winfrey doing th things, Madonna um, Bono, right, and other rock stars having these big relief concerts and things for all of these different causes. And why are they doing all of those things? Because fame and fortune didn't give them the meaning they were looking for. So now they're thinking, let me do some stuff to help hurting people. And maybe that's where I'll find meaning in my life. Solomon says, I tried that. And I found that, even though it's a good thing to help people, he says, I found that to be kind of a hollow thing. It did not produce meaning in my life. And you say, well, how is that possible? You and I as Christians, when we help one another, doesn't, isn't that very gratifying for us as followers of Jesus Christ? Absolutely. But when an unbeliever, when an ungodly man or woman, when someone that's really not committing themselves to the Lord and doing things because the Lord's telling them to do so, when they're just doing it to try and make them feel good about themselves. See, it still keeps them at the center of things. I'm doing this for you to make me feel good about me. Right? It's like a line I heard in a Bette Midler movie years ago. She said, oh, here I am talking about me, talking about me. I, that's enough of that. What do you think about me? <laughs> right? And, and, and really, you know, as long as you and I are at the center of things, as long as we're doing things that draw attention to ourselves, we never find meaning in self-centeredness. I'll help others and that will help me. Or I'll do uh, me good by doing good to others. See, it's still self-centered at the core of it, at the heart of it. And Solomon says, listen, anytime you try and make yourself feel good by doing stuff for other people, it just doesn't last very long. Yeah, it feels great when you're down there in Haiti and you're helping get clean drinking water for poor villages and all of this. But as soon as you come home, you go, wow, that's the feeling left as quickly as it came. So he says of good deeds, this fifth experiment, it didn't really work out for him. It didn't give him the meaning he was looking for. Verse 2, I said of laughter, madness, and of mirth, what does it accomplish? What does it accomplish to feed hungry people? Well, ask Jesus that question. He fed thousands, didn't he? With bread and a couple of fish and all this. Those people got hungry again later, right? Think of everyone that Jesus healed. Didn't they all get sick again and die? There was no lasting benefit in all of those miracles and things. And Solomon is discovering for himself... Wow, when you do good stuff for the people, they just find out, they find themselves in difficult situations again. And listen, I, I think there's some people in, in the community that think the purpose of the church is just to pay people's light bills and uh, pay their rent and pay this and can you help me with that and so forth and so on. And we want to help hurting people. But you know one of the struggles when you help people that have not learned to live within their means and work for what they have and all of this, you're just treating a symptom, aren't you? We had folks back at the 
church in Tennessee. Um, and before I left, I had to have a conversation with them because, you know, they, they, they just, uh, they were hitting up, they were soliciting people every week at the door. They got to know new people better, quicker than anybody else in the church because it's like a new mark, you know. And, and there was a filling station right down the street from the church and we would see the new family filling up this couple's car with gas and everything. And, and uh, you know, when I was leaving to come here, the pastor that I handed that ministry off to, I didn't want him to have that kind of baggage to deal with. So I had to meet with this couple and say, listen, you can come to Calvary Chapel, but you can't come asking for help every week. You need to work. You need to pay your bills. And if you're not paying your bills, you're robbing your employer. You're robbing your landlord. You're robbing whomever. You need to work and pay for your bills. and get. You need to learn to live within your means. There's nothing more stressful for me than helping people that will continue to overspend and over... Uh, you know, th th it's like learn to live within your means like everyone else is doing. See? So Solomon, he's hit trying to help people and it's not really... It didn't give him that warm, fuzzy feeling he was looking for from it. And in verse 2, he mentions laughter. And it looks like he's performing the same experiment from last week. But this word laughter means a mocking kind of a laughter. We would think like a celebrity roast, you know, or a, one of those kind of, you know, the kind of humor that at someone else's expense, always looking for a weakness, take a jab at somebody because of how they look, you know. He tried to find meaning in laughter. He says, well, there's funny, and then there's funny at someone else's expense. And I found out that you, it doesn't, you can't get any meaning in life from either of those. It doesn't last. It doesn't seem to work. So, verse 3, he says, I searched in my heart how to gratify my flesh with, what does your Bible say next? Wine. Wine. His sixth experiment is, can I find meaning or value or purpose in an altered state of consciousness? And wine, had, alcohol happened to be the only thing that they had to alter their consciousness with in that day. Today we have all kinds of things, right? I mean, all kinds of drugs that can alter your consciousness. And notice how he says, I, I searched in my heart how to gratify my flesh and while guiding my heart. And what, what is that speaking of? Well, he speaks of his flesh as distinct from himself. And you and I are not the first ones to try and control our earth suits or housebreak our earth suits into doing things that they're not set up to do. See, he's trying to use wine. Well, here, here's just enough to get a nice buzz. Right? This is just enough to make me happy. To make me kind of loose and relaxed and fun to read around. A little bit more than that, and all of a sudden, I, I'm not remembering things so well. A little bit more than that, I black out. I don't have any memory of what I did at all the night before, right? I, I look, if I drink into that zone, I'm angry. I, you know, some of you, do you remember your days before Christ? Some people were mean drunks, you know? I was always kind of a silly drunk in those days, you know? But Solomon is looking at this now, and I don't glorify those days at all. I just speak it as a matter of fact to you today. Solomon was trying to figure out just how much is the right amount to, just to get the best feeling without getting some sort of a hangover kind of a, kind of hard to find that line, isn't it? He says, I tried to find meaning in an altered state of consciousness. Didn't work out so well. Verse 4, I made my works great. I built myself houses. I planted myself vineyards. I made gardens and orchards and water pools to... To, for the growing trees in the grove. And so his seventh experiment, I want to see if I can find meaning in having these artistically designed homes and gardens. How many of you like to watch HGTV? Right? That, that, I mean, I know a lot of Christians that like HGTV. It's, it's something the husbands and wives can watch together. You don't feel like you're comp. I, I personally, I like the Food Channel. You could probably look at me and tell that, right? <laughs> Um, HGTV, Diners, Drive-Ins, and Dives, that's one of my favorite shows right there. That's good programming. HGTV, though, uh, you know, these couples that come in and they rehab, the, they take these houses and gut them and make the bathrooms bigger and we'll just add a closet to the master. And uh, Listen, there are a lot of people, maybe some of you, in fact, think, if I had just the right kind of house, I'd be happy. And listen, there's nothing wrong with having a nice house, is there? There's nothing wrong with moving from one house to the next. The average family in America is going to move five times in their lifetime 
by recent statistics. You're going to own five homes in your lifetime. I don't know which home you're on right now, but if, if you're not at five, you probably have another move in yet, right? And there's nothing wrong with moving and looking for something that's, uh, we need more natural light. We, now we don't need as many rooms. We don't have the kids to, you know, we're empty nesters. And, you know, people start thinking those, that way, right? Well, I don't, I don't like stairs. How many of you hate stairs? There you go. I mean, I'm with you. I, we have an upstairs. Our girls' bedrooms are all upstairs. I haven't been up there in months. I, they, they, there's no telling what's going on up there. I, I have no, I don't go upstairs. They even joke, Dad won't go upstairs to check on anything, you know, right? On my knees, you know. And what's ironic is my office here is upstairs. <laughs> Do you know how many times I've tripped up those stairs? Right. And that's why people get tired of stairs, right? Because you get tired of tripping and falling on stairs. Well, there are people that think, oh, if I just had the right house. Oh, if I lived in the right neighborhood. Oh, there's too much crime in this city. Let's move to a quieter, smaller town. It'll be nicer. We'll find meaning and happiness. If, if we just lived in that house, in that community, in that part of town, oh, then I would be happy, we say. And Solomon built himself orchards and palaces. and I mean, he did, all of this stuff that he built. And he said, you know what? That didn't do it for me either. So in verse 7, I acquired male and female servants and had servants born in my house. Yes, I had greater possessions of herds and flocks than all who were in Jerusalem before me. Verse 7, this is our eighth experiment that he's conducting. I want to get people to do everything for me. When I was a kid, I, you know, I, I came up in the generation that got the remote control. Right? How many, how many of you remember that? Before the remote control, what did parents do? Hey, Philip, go change the channel for me. Right? When I was a kid... Any of you have to change the channel for your dad, right? Come on, football games, go change it to five. We had three channels. We're, we were so deprived, kids. We only had three channels, and at certain times you turn it on, you just got nothing, right? There's nothing on there, no programming at all, right? Well, we have remote controls and ceiling fans and all of this. Solomon said, I'm just going to have people fan me when I'm hot. I'm going to have people go get me something to drink when I'm thirsty. No matter what I'm hungry for, I'll have somebody ready to go and make it. I'll have people to do everything for me. Because if I can get people to do everything for me, then I'll be happy. Then I'll find meaning. And, and again, guys, some of us in this room, we think that that would make us happy. You have a dream vacation where you get to spend money in a way that you normally don't spend money, right? You go out to eat and you do stuff. You just throw caution to the wind. And I'm on vacation, right? And everything is much nicer than at home. And you think, oh, if I could just live in vacation mode forever, then I would be happy. Absolutely not. Things wear off, don't they? I mean, you get a new car and, oh, the new car smell and this is so comfortable and it practically drives itself. And, you know, a year later you've got three-month-old french fries in the seat, you know, and you, right? You don't keep it clean. Now, some people, they keep it clean, and they keep it like mint condition all the time, and they wash it every weekend, and some of you are like that, right? But really, does it make you as happy after you've had that automobile a year as the day you drove it home? Or the house? Or And see, this is a word of counsel for young couples looking for your first home. Live within your means. Don't try and start out where your parents, it took them 25 years to, to get to that place. Don't try and start out where it took your parents 25 years to get to. Live within your means. Don't overspend. Don't get more and better. Be frugal. Start smart and live within your means. You know why? Because after the new wears off, it's just a house. After the new wears off, it's just a car, right? It, see how practical this is for you and I? Because Solomon, he says, hey, I've tested all of these theories to see if you can find meaning and happiness, and I couldn't find it. Well, verses 8 and 9, um, I, I, I gathered for myself silver and gold and the special treasures of kings. You say, what are the, what are the special treasures of kings? Well, kings could have more wives than everybody else. Because I've got to secure the bloodline. We've got to have many offspring that could take the throne if something were to happen to me. Right? You know, we've got to have a lot of, a lot of kids. And so they had a lot of wives. That would be a, 
a, a unique, special treasure of kings. And, and you go, well, no, wait a minute, though. Is that right, though? Uh, remember when David got busted by the prophet for taking this one man's sheep, and all this was really talking about Bathsheba? Remember? What the prophet told him from the Lord was this. Hey, if you didn't have enough, I would have given you more. More wives. But you didn't have to take another man's wife. I mean, that's really low, David. And David, you know, repented of all of this. But what's interesting, when the Lord is, is rebuking David, he's saying, hey, if, if, if the four or five wives that you had at that point was not enough, I, w- I could have given you more wives. Isn't that wild? The kings had more wives. Kings, the, the special treasures of kings, it was also the, the kind of gifts that people from other countries would come and bring. You know, here's a mask. Here's a Zulu warrior mask, you know, that our chief wore this in our la- before he was killed by a panther. And he, we, we give this to you, O king, as a gift. And, you know, so the kings, they had all kinds of special, cool little trinkets and stuff in their house, right? Here's a blowgun that, you know, we took out a ostrich in full, you know, I don't know if they kill an ostrich, but yeah, that's the first thing that came to my head. But he had all of this cool stuff, right? I mean, you go in, it's like a museum, and then he's got everything you could possibly imagine. And think of it this way. If you got to go on a shopping spree at Walmart, you could get anything in Walmart that you wanted to get. And that's a store that has a lot of stuff, right? Now, you think that that would bring you some happiness. But would it bring you lasting happiness? What if your pantry was Walmart? See, that's what Solomon had. Uh, Solomon had all of that in his pantry. What you and I think of as Walmart, he had all of that in his pantry. That, that was his kitchen pantry. All that you have, I mean, for, the, for whatever they had in that day, they had it. He had all of that. But he also, when you think about the wives that he had, then the children that all of those wives had, then you think of all of the servants. Can you imagine what it cost to feed that family? Every meal, every day. Whew. Wow. It says in verses 8 and 9 also that he, he had all of these singers. And, uh, you know, today we have iPods and iPads and MP3s and all of this type of stuff. But Solomon just had all the great singers. I, you know, I feel like a song. Someone, Annie, dance for me. Let's hear a little song. <laughs> <laughs> you see Danny, Annie d- d- you know, doing a little ballet move across the <laughs> palace floor and singing Tiptoe Through the Two Lips or something like that, right? Well, thank you. That was good. I, this, you see, he, he had singers. They could just break out in song anytime he wanted music. He had every musical in- instrument you could imagine. Uh, a multitude of women from every place in the world. That made up his 700 wives and 300 concubines. And some of you are like, oh, you know, uh, exotic beauty, right? Wow, that would be cool. Or an exotically handsome young man. Solomon had, he had a girl from every country. Wow. And he's saying, listen, I didn't find any meaning in all of this. Verse 10, whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure. And as I stated earlier, how many people can make that kind of a statement? Who has the means to fulfill every impulse and desire? And who has the freedom to say, I think I want to try this. And if you think it's against the law, I've changed the laws. And I'll have you put in prison for saying it's against the law. This is the king. He could do anything, right? He had the freedom to try these things out. And in verses, um, verse 11, he says, I looked at all my works and that my hands had done and on the labor in which I toiled, and indeed it was all chabel. It was all empty. It was all grasping for the wind, feeding on air. There was no profit under the sun, he says in verse 11. So of all of these experiments, he says, it was just a mirage. None of it had any lasting or real value in my heart. So I turned myself to consider, he says in verses 12 through 16. And the phrase, I turned myself to consider, that is, um, that's the very basic definition of a contemplative. Now, I'm not a smart man in the sense that Solomon is a smart man. But I am a contemplative. 
You know, I've always, I, when I was a boy, I remember I would ask my parents questions that just rattled them. And I wasn't trying to rattle, you know, and color outside the lines of Christianity so much as I've just always been a contemplative. I, I've, I've always been kind of an old soul, if you, if you understand what I'm taking my meaning. I love to go to the mall and just sit on a bench and watch people. What, what they're doing to try and be happy, what they're, well, how they're talking with one another. I, you know, I, quite often I'll look over and there's a guy that's 30 years older than me. <laughs> He's watching people too. That's just, I, God wired me that way. I'm a contemplative. I'm constantly just, hmm, look at that. Lord, why are they trying to make themselves happy with that? But Lord, I'm that way too, aren't I? Why do I try and make myself happy with stuff like that? And just, just introspective kind of thinking. Solomon was that kind of man. Verse 12, I turned myself to consider wisdom and madness and folly. For what can the man do who succeeds the king? Only what's been done. Then I saw that wisdom excels folly. And what he's talking about in verse 13 is his tenth experiment was contrasting intelligence with ignorance. Okay, I know that there's no true meaning. I already discovered that, he said earlier, in wisdom and knowledge and education. We learned that last week in our Bible study, right? But this experiment where it's different, he, I wanted to see the value of contrasting intelligence and ignorance. I mean, which one is better here? And he said, well, intelligence is better than ignorance when it, when it comes down to it. But the problem with both the intelligent man and the ignorant man is they both die and are forgotten. We need to be reminded, reminded of that sometimes, don't we? We're all, what, what's the death rate? Ten out of ten people still die. <laughs> all right? Uh, you know, and the only time we allow ourselves to really think about that is if we have to go to a funeral. Right? Then we think about our mortality in all of this. But we all die. He said, well, intelligent or uh, you know, ignorant, uh, they both die. I, I read a quote by uh, C.E. Stewart... He said, death is a worm at the root of the tree of pleasure. It mars pleasure. It chills enjoyment for it cuts off man just when he would sit down after years of toil to reap the fruit of his labor. Isn't that the truth? That's the truth. Young people, you don't realize this. When you look into the eyes of an older person, behind those eyes, there's still a young kid. Right? Uh, we look older, but inside we're, just, we're still kind of a kid. And it's like, yeah, I wish I could run the bases. And, you know, you, you know, my body, it's funny, running around the woods back here, I love getting to be a kid back here with our harvest hoe down. But, you know, it's a sign that you're getting older when your mind knows things to do that your body will not follow. <laughs> right? You know what I'm talking about? Well, I'm just going to run across here. And I ran and I tripped four times and fell in the briars. I was laughing at myself because nobody could see me. I was in the dark, you know. So he's doing all of these experiments now. In verse 17, he says, therefore. Therefore is kind of a summary statement, isn't it? Anytime you see the word therefore, you want to see what it's there for, right? That's an old Calvary thing. Therefore, in light of everything up to this point, occupational fulfillment, education, hanging out with crazy people, hanging out with funny people, doing good to feel good about yourself, mocking laughter, drinking uh, building gardens and parks and having servants to do everything and having all the royal cool possessions of kings and contrasting intelligence and ignorance. In, in, in light of all of that, verse 17, after the word therefore, what does your Bible say? I hated life. And notice that is past tense. That's not the way Solomon feels at the time of writing Ecclesiastes. He's writing Ecclesiastes as an older grandfather type of man that's wanting the next generation to figure some things out. Learn from my experience, says the older man. But at the time that he was going through it, he said, I tried to find meaning in all of this stuff, and I just hated life. Hated life. See, the illusion of all of this happiness in all these areas, he, he discovered you can't find what you're looking for. You won't get the meaning you're looking for in those things. Nothing satisfied me. It was all a happiness mirage. We cannot make heaven on earth, contrary to some preachers in these last days. We cannot make heaven on earth. Heaven is heaven, and earth is earth. Right? L listen to this story that I stumbled upon. A fictional character 
that got anything he wished for instantly says this. He, he wanted a house, and there, there it was with servants at the door. He wanted a limousine, limousine. There was a chauffeur. He was elated at the beginning, but bored with it soon enough. And he said to his assistant, I want to get out of this. I want to create something. I want to suffer something. I would rather be in hell than here. And the attendant answered, well, where do you think you are? Wow. You know, the Romans used to have a saying about the gods. When a god really wants to torture a human being, he gives him what he asks for. The things that you think would make you happy. See, you don't have all of those things and the enemy dangling it like a carrot out in front of you keeps you running after all of these things. But if you look to Hollywood, if you look to the wealthy elite, if you look around the world to the people that have actually acquired the stuff that you just stay up late thinking about how you could get it, you would be as miserable as they are. Because you can't find meaning in all of these things. Wow. Well, verses 18 through 23 he talks about having to leave everything to somebody else when he dies. And, and, and it's not selfishness that's causing him to despair over leaving his life's work to his children. And that, say amen if you're still listening. Okay. He realizes that the difficulties in achieving success prepare one to oversee the success when you get there. Let me put it another way. Climbing the mountain prepares somebody to stay on top of the mountain. You follow me? And if you worked hard and lived frugal and struggled and went without and all of this, and you built up a great business and you got out of debt, but you did not teach your children to live the same way, they will go through your money in a minute after you're gone. And that's what he's talking about. If you give all your life's work to someone that didn't work for it, they're just going to go through it hastily. There was a book that came out, oh, it's been maybe 20 years or so ago. It was called The Millionaire Next Door. Anybody ever read that? It was a very insightful read about, you know, first-generation wealth in America. And it's, it's just amazing that so many plumbers and uh, salvage yard guys are millionaires in America. You wouldn't think that that's the millionaires in America, right? Well, I was talking with my cousin, one of the wealthiest men in the state of Tennessee. He knows the Kennedys, the Siegenthalers, and uh, very well connected in that world and everything. And he and I were talking about this book because he had read it as well. And, and he and I were our kindred spirits. We, I'd, I'd meet him for lunch, and we took the Lord's Supper together in his office. And he kept our family in automobiles for years, never asked him for a thing. The Lord just told him to do it, and he would do it. And... Uh, loving to death, Bob Frensley is who I'm speaking of. And um, I asked him if he'd read this book, and he said, yeah, you know, that's, that's one that I actually picked up and read. And, and we were talking about the fact that both of us have three daughters. And he's much older than I, and his daughters were grown up now and all of this. But we were talking about this very thing, that you're going to give everything that you've worked hard for to the next generation that hasn't worked hard for it, they haven't learned how to live within their means. They just spend, spend, spend. Isn't that right? If you still have kids at home, don't you see it? Well, you'd never pay $20 for a Justin Bieber CD, but man, they can't, they can't wait to part with the money that you just gave them to go get a Justin, to get the Bieber fever, right? <laughs> well, you wouldn't go and get Zaxby's three or four times a week, but they don't have any problem going to Zaxby's three or four times a week. I'll eat something at the house. I don't want, you, Right? And so what Solomon is speaking about here in verses 18 through 23 is the futility of acquiring and saving and preparing and then handing it off to somebody because you die. You don't hand it off willingly. You die. And you leave it all to them. And they just go through it. Right? Old wealth. And that's fourth generation wealth and on. The people that know how to give it to the next generation and the next generation does not go through it and they give it to the next generation and they don't go through it and the next generation, fourth generation, has it and they don't go through it. Do you know what old wealth, fourth generation wealth sees position and prosperity as? A family responsibility. That's why the royal family, if you remember back to when 
you know, the Prince uh, William, you know, when, when Harry, when, when they were just 16, 17 years old, what did the family have them do? Go work in an orphanage in South America with no uh, toiletries, running water. and I, we, We're going to make it a little tough on you. You've got to go off to military school and boarding. You've got to go through all of these things. Why? Because you are going to inherit a fortune one day, and you have to protect the family fortune for the next generation. See? And really, think of how joyless really that is in a sense too. That all I'm supposed to do is protect all of this old stuff for the next generation who protects it for the, right? And so he's looking at this idea of, well, I'm just going to, everything I worked for, I'm going to hand off to somebody and he's going to go through it. And his son Rehoboam did exactly that. I mean, the, the kingdom is divided within a, just a few short years after Solomon dies and everything is gone. Everything in the temple got taken by the Babylonians and just uh, uh, Arameans or... Uh, my goodness and, and in this passage of scripture and I'm, I've not read it all to you um, because we read it at the beginning but at the end of verse 23 he says even in the night his heart takes no rest you get an insight into what it's like to be wealthy you get a glimpse of the worries that come with success you know what you get with it sleeplessness you're worried about somebody taking what you have do you remember what it was like, your first automobile, and it was an old junker that you never locked the doors? You could leave something of value under a dirty rag in the floorboard, and it was safer than Fort Knox, right? Because nobody goes near an old beat-up car. But now you're driving something nice, and oh, we can't leave it unlocked, and we've got to have the boop, 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 boop. You know, you got the little buttons for it and, and all of this, and well, I've got to have good light in the driveway because you know, if you don't have nice lighting, someone's going to come up and try and take and... You lose a lot of sleep over all this stuff that you, that you have at a point, right? And Solomon says, wow, this, this wasn't that great either. Worrying about maintaining and protecting and extending and expanding wealth. I asked my cousin this once. I said, how many more millions do you have to make, Bob? He said, well, I just need a few more. At the time, he was negotiating a deal with Walmart to sell some property, and it was, and he showed me this check. That my eyes just fell out of my head. I'd never seen a check that large, you know. And he turned it down. That's not enough. I, we got to have more than that to make this deal. When you have a lot, you're always thinking, "Well, I, but I need a little bit more." And, and this is all, you know, uh, um, proportionate to. Yeah. We, we all experience this on some level, don't we? I mean, as a newlywed, Tammy and I, had, we, we were thrilled if we had maybe 20 to 70 bucks in our checking account after we paid our bills. Oh, we got some cushion. <laughs> if something happens, we're okay, right? 20 to 70 dollars in checking account now? I couldn't sleep like that. I had to go out and get three or four more jobs. I, I, can't, I, can't, I couldn't get any rest with that. I've got to have more of a padding and netting, and right? Isn't that the way we are? How, how much do you think you have to have? Let me just put a number on it. Well, I think I need... If, if, if your number is in the thousands, you're probably losing some sleep over this stuff, aren't you? Right? He says, I tried to find meaning in this, and that didn't work, and then I've got to leave all of this to somebody else. And here's the rub of it now, verse 24. He said, nothing is better for a man than that he should eat and drink and that his soul should enjoy good in his labor. This also I saw was from the hand of God. What he's actually saying in verse 24 is this. Enjoy today. Enjoy what you have today. Enjoy who you are today. Enjoy the moment. Live in this moment. And as some of you in this room, you can't even enjoy church because you're thinking about all the stuff you're going to do when you leave here today. You're worrying about all the stuff you've got to do after this, right? You don't know how to live in the moment. When you learn to live in the moment, you know what? You won't find yourself in as big a hurry. The men that meet with me on Saturday nights to pray, 
we pray until we have prayed over everything sufficiently. We're in no hurry to leave the moment. And then after we finish praying, we just kind of turn around in our chairs and talk about what the Lord's doing in our lives and everything. And we're still not in a hurry. And it's one of the sweetest times in the week for me personally. Wouldn't you agree, Greg? Others, right? You know what's beautiful about it? We're just in the moment. When you come home, be home, dads, husbands. You know what I'm talking about? Don't bring your work home. That's a word for pastors as well. Sometimes I'm still in the study mode. I'm still, or I'm counseling people that it can wait till another, we can talk about that later. I need to play with my kids. I need to listen to my wife and find out how her day went. I need to live in the moment, right? Do you live in the moment? Because out of all of these experiments, what Solomon is saying is this. Hey, if you don't learn how to just relax and enjoy this present moment, which is all, by the way, that any of us are promised, isn't it? Uh, if today was the day that the Lord called you home, did you spend the day the way it would have been pleasing to Him and to your family? Or did you race around to do all of this stuff that's not that important? Living in the moment. The wisest man that ever lived, he said, oh, you need to enjoy. And the word enjoy is the word ra'ah. Would you say that with me? Very good. It means to feel, experience, and inspect. To feel, experience, and inspect. That means to squeeze blood out of a turnip. I mean, that means to get every bit of fun out of the moment. Right? Last week at the Harvest Hoedown, when we were having that crazy hayride, that was a good example of living in the moment for me and those guys. Why? We were having a blast throwing everything we could find on the poor children <laughs> and adults that rode, rode our little ride back there, right? And you know what? We were content to stay back there. We were tired. We were all cut up and everything. But we, we were not going to leave the moment until we had thrown the last handful of raw spaghetti. We're out of supplies. We're done. Time to come back in. See how bad we all look, you know. Living in the moment. Some of you are going to leave here today. You're not going to stay for the spaghetti lunch because you're not comfortable with church people yet. You're still kind of keeping us out. You're not, you're not ready to just let us in. And I, I get that, you know. I, it, when you haven't figured out how you feel about a church, yeah, you just you want to slip out and, you know, well, that's okay, we've got plans, and you don't really have plans. You just don't want to eat with a bunch of church people that you don't know that well, right? <laughs> I get that. I've done that. I've done that myself, see. But you want to learn to live in the moment because the moment is all you've really got to take joy in, says Solomon. Live in the moment. And then the, the last verses talk about the natural law of retribution. That is that God gives to gives to the good and he takes from the sinner and you say well that doesn't look like that's really happening to me oh it is see we're just in the middle of our own story aren't we right now you think you're getting trampled on by the world and the, 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 the wicked man seems to be flourishing and the righteous are perishing all day long right that sound familiar and it doesn't seem like things are that fair around here I always end up you know with the short end of the stick and all. But we're in the middle of our story of our story one day you're going to be in heaven as a prince or a princess in the royal family. And see how he's let you work in an orphanage in South America so you know how to look after the family's wealth. Isn't that something? You have a father that loves you so much. He says, I, don't want to, I can't just give you everything now. I, you know, I know that sounds good in some pulpits and churches and everything, but that's not the way I treat my kids. I don't want a bunch of spoiled brats that go through everything. I want to put you through a little suffering, a little tough stuff to, so you have character. Then you're ready to take your responsibilities in the royal family that lasts forever. And doesn't that put things in perspective for you if you're going through a, a rough moment right here in this vapor of a life? It's just a vapor of a life, isn't it? I mean, what are 80 or 90 or 100 years? Billy Graham will be 95 years old this week. He's going to have his My Hope 
uh, TV event. It's a crusade across the United States. He wants one last opportunity to share the gospel. November 7th, I hope that you'll invite someone to your living room to watch this My Hope crusade because it's, it, Billy's 95 years old and we think, oh man, he's lived a long and faithful life for the Lord. 95 is nothing compared to eternity. And the Lord says, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I know it's been tough, but I'm just preparing you. Because you're royalty. And I know, yeah, if you weren't royalty, I could let you have everything and go through it and squander it and mess it up and, and then you're just done. But you're part of the royal family. So I, listen, I need to take some time and get, get you ready for eternity. And that's what this life is about for the believer. Amen? Would you bow your head?